Greetings, friends. It's me, Wayman. And sorry it took me so long to get back on here. Been working and stuff. It's summertime, and I've been doing a lot of outdoor activities. And um, family and work has been kind of demanding, so I want to get back on and do another um, installment of a commentary on the Odyssey by Homer. And in the first video, uh, I kind of reviewed what I would be doing. And the second video might be in two parts. Depends on when YouTube cuts me off. I've been using this auto-upload rather than my camera because it takes me forever to upload things. And uh, so we'll see how it goes. So the first four books are called the Telemachy because it's the adventures of Telemachus, uh, Odysseus's son. And what's interesting about these epics like biblical writings, the narrator, we, we sit by his elbow. We sit by his elbow. So he controls our feelings and inserts ideas and political ideas and thoughts and moods and he, and he slants the outcome of the story in certain ways. And you see this happening a lot of times when uh, great writers of plays like Sophocles and the great Euripides um, took and expanded some of these uh, writings about what happened to heroes when they came back, uh, such as uh, the leader of men, Agamemnon, if you've ever seen the play Agamemnon, uh, it's excellent. Um, and, and that'll come up in the first part of the, the, the Odyssey here. But the Rhapsoid uh, would do performances and, and uh, for the public, and they'd be done in one day. And a good example of uh, a discussion with a rhapsody would be that of the dialogue of uh, Plato, Ion, if you read that. And you can see how uh, the rhapsody would control the emotions of the crowd and how he had to pay attention to that. So here we go to Ion uh, by Plato. And I, I just want to read a little section of that, starting off, so, so you kind of get the idea of how all this happened. And, and biblical writers, as I said, uh, did it too. The David cycle, the Saul cycle, uh, and uh, the text, uh, especially First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, all of that. You were sitting at the writer's elbow, and they were inserting in opinions and giving you the picture to lay out the landscape, so you would come to the conclusions uh, that may have not been written. Excellent. So, here Ion says uh, to so Socrates, Socrates takes him to task, asking him all these questions, and, and Ion says, uh, Only too well, for I look down, up, down at them from the stage, and behold, the various emotions of pity, wonder, sternness, stamped upon their countenances when I am speaking, and I am obligated to give my very best attention to them. For if I make them cry, I myself shall laugh, and if I make them laugh, I myself shall cry when the time of payment arrives. So he says, I control the moods and I need to pay attention to that and be excellent at what I do, excellent at reciting, because that's how I make my living. Beautiful. So then we get to the first book of the Odyssey, which mainly we're, we're introduced to all the characters and all the things and all the people that will be a major part of this. And right off the bat, um, we come across a lot of the characters and a lot of the names. Uh, we learn about what they're like, and we even have some hints about what's going to happen when the great Odysseus returns. So the opening line starts out, uh, it's... Um, an ode to the muse, a call to the muse. And, and, a, and a lot of times people don't really understand the importance or the idea of the muse. They, they think the bard itself was, was the muse. or uh, But I believe uh, the muses were from Mount Helicon and uh, they were uh, the goddesses of inspiration. Uh, and so you would call the muse this was divine interaction, divine interaction with the human being, with the bard, 
and together they would tell the story. So, so here I wanted to read from Fagel's the opening line of the Iliad. It's very beautiful. Uh, Sing to me of the man muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he plundered the hallowed vaws and heights of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. Many pains he suffered, heartsick of open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster. Hard as he strove, the recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. The blind fools, they devoured the cattle of the sun, and the sun god wiped, sight the day, wiped from sight the day of the return. Launch out on his story, muse, daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will. Sing for our time too. Beautiful. Sing for our time too. So, uh, Hesiod in Theogony, Theogony, sorry, um, tells us a little bit about that in his his uh, introduction. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to read a section to that. Pro probably uh, lines right around lines 22 to 27. And, and this is Hesiod's experience on uh, his intro being inspired by the muses which uh, is very beautiful and one day they taught he said glorious song while he was shepherding his lambs under holy helicon and this word first the goddess said to me the muses of olympus daughters of zeus who hold the aegis shepherds of the wilderness wretched things of shame, mere bellies, we know how to speak many false things as though they were true. But we know when we will to utter true things. So said the ready-voiced daughters of great Zeus, and they plucked and gave me a rod, a shoot of sturdy laurel, a marvelous thing, and breathed into me a divine voice to celebrate things that shall be, and things that were aforetime and they bade me sing of the race of blessed gods, which are eternally, but ever to sing of themselves, both first and last. So it's from uh, Hesiod's Theogony, uh, 22 to 27. So this comes in uh, biblical literature, uh, especially Ezekiel and Isaiah. So here's Isaiah 6, 6 to 8. And, and, and you can kind of think about some of this stuff. You might say, Wayman, you're on. You might say, Wayman, you don't know what you're talking about. But... Here is part of that. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your crookedness is taken away, and your sin is covered. And I heard a voice from Adonai, saying, Whom do I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Beautiful. So, at the start of the Iliad, there's a divine council, and the subject is on Aegisthus, who killed the great Agamemnon as he re returned home, and he wooed Agamemnon's life, uh, wife, uh, Clyte Clytemnestra, and together uh, they both conspired to kill uh, Agamemnon. And Athena, who is going to be Odysseus's helper uh, in, in, the, in the Odyssey. In the Iliad, gods and men are interacting, but here it's just about mostly Athena and um, the great Odysseus uh, and how she helps him. So she makes the case to Zeus for Odysseus. And w while Zeus is having the conversation about the suffering of men, uh, she turns it around and says, but what about Odysseus hasn't he suffered enough? So we'll get we'll get into the divine council uh, in the next video. And I want to do this in sections because I, I don't want you all to fall asleep, and I, I want you to stay with me. So in the third video on the commentary on the Odyssey, uh, we'll look at the divine council, and maybe we'll get to uh, when Athena s inspires uh, Telemachus and gives him hope that his father is still alive. Take care, friends. Hopefully you enjoyed that. And remember, if everybody's thinking alike, somebody isn't thinking.